Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Tom Ristenpart from University of California, San Diego. He is one of the best students of <laughs> Mihir Velare, and he's going to talk today about new, his work on constructing cryptographic hash functions. Uh, thanks. Uh, I don't know if uh, the best student is the uh, uh, appropriate description, but uh, one of his students, at least. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, cryptographic hash functions and how we'd like to uh, how to build them. Uh, and this is joint work with my advisor, Mihir Bilari. So, oops. So what is a cryptographic hash? Oh, so I should say, before I get into everything, I'm going to try and keep this pretty accessible. I don't know if everyone here is a cryptographer or not, uh, but if, uh, if you feel free to jump in with questions if uh, something's not clear. So what is a cryptographic hash function? Well, it's a deterministic, publicly computable function from some large domain to a small domain. and it's, uh, that, that means it's a function f that maps a bit string of almost any length, perhaps arbitrary length, to some small fixed uh, length, for example, 160 bits. And what makes these uh, functions interesting is that they provide compression with security guarantees, which we'll be talking about throughout the rest of the talk. And they've become very handy tools in cryptography and security uh, and are used quite widely in uh, protocols and, and tools such as SSH and SSL and IPsec, whose security rely on having secure cryptographic uh, hash functions. So to motivate one of the uh, uh, security guarantees that we would like from a cryptographic hash function, let's look at a traditional application, which is digital signature schemes. And a digital signature scheme is going to allow some uh, party to attest the authorship of a message. And one of the traditional ways of, of making a uh, digital signature scheme is using cryptographic hash functions. So one has a, a, some type of big message, like an email message or a file, and what you first do is compress it using a cryptographic hash function to generate a small message digest. And then this is run through a, a signing algorithm using some secret key only known to the person trying to generate the signature uh, to generate this, this signature. And then, uh, so the party who generated this uh, uh, signature can send their public key uh, this big message and a signature to someone else and then they can verify that the, uh, the uh, signature is correct and therefore that this person who had the secret key generated the message. So we can see that uh, if we have an adversary now who just knows the public key and not the secret key, if he's able to find two messages that aren't equal but that hash down to the same value, then we're going to end up with uh, signatures that are equal. and Maybe this adversary can then convince uh, the person who actually has the secret key to sign message one, and then he can uh, take that resulting signature and give someone else message two in the signature and, and trick them into thinking uh, the uh, other message was what was signed. And this would then uh, break our confidence in the digital signature scheme, allowing us to actually attest to uh, uh, particular messages. So we call this a collision, finding uh, two messages, M1 uh, and M2, not, that aren't equal but that hash to the same value. And so to build uh, secure digital signature schemes, we would want uh, that no adversary should be able to efficiently find collisions. So how do we build uh, hash functions that give us collision resistance? Well, the popular current design paradigm it proceeds as follows. One starts with a compression function uh, that maps a d-bit message block and an n-bit chaining variable to an n-bit string. And then one uses this compression function as a black box to build a hash function that works on arbitrary length strings or close to arbitrary length strings. The second step is really characterized by specifying a domain extension transform, which really tells one how to use this uh, fixed input length compression function to hash uh, long strings. So to build a collision resistant hash function, what we're going to want to do is build a domain extension transform that is what is called collision resistance preserving which means that if our compression function f is itself collision resistant, that means it's hard to find collisions against it, then building a hash function using our collision resistance preserving transform and this compression function will result in a hash function that uh, 
enjoys this property also. So the canonical transform in this, in this uh, uh, domain is the, what's not commonly known as the strength in merkle damgard uh, transform. And it just specifies that you take an input message, append to it its length, and then chunk that into uh, some blocks and iterate the compression function over the result. And here the IV is just a constant initialization vector for the first chain variable. And this is a little bit of a simplification. There's some more padding rules involved, but uh, this will suffice for our discussion. And uh, this is, the, in fact, the transform that was used to construct uh, uh, the MD and SHA family of hash functions, which are uh, the most widely used today. And so in this talk, I'm really going to be talking about transforms and what type of transforms do we want to uh, use to help us build hash functions and not so much about compression functions. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's been some recent uh, collision finding attacks published against uh, hash functions such as MD5 and SHA-1, and they show how to find two messages that uh, hash to the same value. Now, these attacks don't uh, imply that the transform is weak. Um, in fact, they show that the compression function is weak, uh, so the contrapositive of our previous guarantee gives us that since we found collisions against the full hash function, we've actually shown that the uh, compression function itself is not collision resistant. So the attacks are actually um, pretty damaging. The MD5 attacks are, are quite practical. Uh, for I think the best uh, attacks right now to generate uh, collisions for a random, two random appearing messages that are different in just a few bits requires just 11 minutes on a, uh, a personal computer. Much uh, more recently, we've, they've shown, uh, some researchers have shown that one can find uh, much more structured messages and uh, that collide, um, such as, for example, X509 certificates. And that requires significantly more computational effort, uh, about six months, but still certainly tractable. And, and they actually did compute a, a, a collision for two uh, valid X509 certificates. The uh, SHA-1 attacks, on the other hand, are, are what cryptographers would call efficient. Uh, and to generate uh, uh, collisions for random messages would take approximately, I think the best one right now is two to the 63 operations. But it seems that every, uh, every conference you go to, this, this exponent's decreasing a little bit. So in response to this, uh, these uh, recent attacks, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology has announced that they were going to hold a national hash function, uh, a competition for a new national hash function standard. And I just want to bring your attention to, uh, so they, they, they gave a, uh, uh, in January they announced some, whoops, uh, proposed requirements for the competition. And let me just draw your attention to two of those. Uh, one, of course, is the collision resistance. And the second is this mysterious notion of indistinguishable from a random oracle. Um, so we've already seen good motivation for why we would want hash functions that are collision resistant. Uh, let me talk about what this indistinguishable from random oracle uh, might mean or does mean. Uh, so a random oracle is uh, a, an idealized object that just maps every input string to a randomly chosen output string. It's uh, an oracle in the sense that we give uh, uh, access to it to all parties involved in a cryptographic uh, protocol, so both honest and uh, dishonest parties. And what the random oracle really represents is a, a completely idealized black box notion of hash functions. In, in some sense, a random oracle is uh, all that we could ever ask from a hash function. And why is our random oracles important? Well, they've been used to prove the security of schemes uh, uh, of very important schemes. So, for example, RSA OAP, RSA PSS, which are an encryption and, and uh, digital signature scheme that are uh, standardized and, and used um, very widely. And so the, the arguments that uh, show that these are secure encryption and digital signature schemes rely on modeling the, uh, a hash function as a random oracle. Of course, in the real world, we don't have uh, this oracle in the sky providing random looking outputs. So in practice, we instantiate this random oracle with a real hash function f. And a popular choice has previously been SHA-1, um, and I guess still is to a certain extent. So <coughs> this, uh, this means that we want to build hash functions that uh, as closely as possible mimic the behavior of a random oracle. And so the question is, well, if we use hash functions to build uh, I'm sorry, if we use uh, merkle damgard with strengthening type transforms to build our hash functions, is that going to give us a hash function that acts like a random oracle? So unfortunately, that's, that's not really the case. Um, so let me go over an attack on 
uh, hash functions built using Merkle Damgar with strengthening called an extension attack. And this has been known for uh, quite some time. So if we have a message M sub question mark that's unknown to an adversary, and we additionally, uh, and we give this adversary an, a new, a different message X that it does know, the length of this unknown message, and the hash of this unknown message, then it's actually quite easy for the adversary to compute the hash of a related message, which we'll call the extended message, which is the unknown message concatenate with its length, concatenate with this known message X. So to see this, for example, let's just think that all the messages involved are one block in length. And we can see that given these three values, the adversary can use the compression function uh, twice uh, with initial uh, chaining variable being the hash, that it's, hash value that it's given. And in fact, it's going to be able to compute exactly the hash of this extended message. Uh, so why do we care about this? This doesn't actually affect collision resistance, uh, of course. But it does mean that this hash function construct with merkle damgrau with strength does not behave like a random oracle. And to see why this is true, we can think about uh, comparing the above setting to a setting where we do have replaced the hash function with a true random oracle, which again is going to be mapping all input bits to random, uh, randomly chosen output uh, bits. And we can see that giving an adversary this known message x and uh, this length value and the random oracle's output on this unknown message, it's still going to be hard for the adversary to compute the random oracle's output on, a, on the extended message. And the important thing to note here is that this is true regardless of how strong the compression function is. So even if the compression function if is, f is completely secure and itself a, a, a random oracle or ideal, then this discrepancy in the two settings uh, exists. And this is because the, the transform that we used um, was insufficient. So recently some cryptographers uh, noting this uh, problem and the fact that we really are using hash functions to instantiate random oracles uh, asked that we should be minimally trying to validate uh, this usage uh, under this assumption that the compression function is itself ideal. And so they said, well, why don't we not worry about building uh, transforms that are collision resistance preserving, but instead try and build transforms that are what we're going to call pseudorandom oracle preserving. And this just means that if the compression function is itself uh, ideal, then it's going to imply that the hash function constructed from uh, this compression function and a uh, pseudorandom oracle preserving transform is going to behave uh, very much like a random oracle. And we'll call this, this property of behaving like a random oracle being a pseudorandom oracle. And there, there are very uh, formal definitions for, for what this means. Um, but uh, for the purpose of talk, I'm not really going to get into the formalisms uh, and just stick with this intuition that means behaves like. And in particular, property like attacks like the one we just saw on the last uh, slide uh, won't be possible against such hash functions. So to complicate matters a little bit, um, uh, these, this notion of a pseudorandom oracle uh, only really exists in some idealized model. So we have to make some uh, strong assumption about some component, which in our case we're making about the compression function. And this, this is uh, implied by some impossibility results that show that even if you do prove scheme, some certain schemes secure when using a random oracle, whenever you instantiate uh, this random oracle with a, an efficiently computable real hash function, the scheme is no longer secure. So these impossibility results uh, imply that we need to make some idealized assumption um, and uh, mean that in, in practice we can't really make something always that's going to be exactly like a random oracle. But nevertheless, this pseudorandom oracle preservation property is still very important because uh, it's going to mean that meeting it means that we're not introducing structural weaknesses into our, tran uh, into our um, hash function just via the transform. So we saw that uh, this transform merkle damgrau strengthening is not a pseudo is not pseudorandom oracle preserving, uh, and so several new pseudorandom oracle preserving transforms have been proposed. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'll just talk about the chop transform, which is the simplest. And what it does is it iterates the compression function f over blocks of the message input, and then it runs the resulting output through a chopping function, which just truncates uh, its input. So it throws away some of the bits and, uh, and outputs the result. And in fact, this uh, actually uh, suffices to hide uh, the structure of the transform. So let's see how this uh, extension attack against MD 
uh, hash functions built with Merkle Dam guards uh, with strengthening fails against this hash functions built with this transform. So if we give uh, an adversary now an un uh, a message x and the hash of some unknown message, we don't need the length anymore. Uh, then it's actually going to be hard still for this uh, adversary to compute the hash of uh, the uh, related extended message. And we can see this because the hash of the uh, unknown message that's given to the adversary uh, is equal to this. We, we run it through the compression function once, and then we chop off a bunch of the bits. And so to mount the uh, trivial attack that we talked about before, uh, the adversary would need to know those bits that were chopped off to be able to uh, compute the uh, hash of the extended message. And so it's exactly those bits that were, uh, were removed which uh, uh, disabled the adversary from uh, mounting this attack. And so in this way it's serving to hide some structure of the underlying iteration. And uh, therefore the chop transform is pseudorandomorical preserving. So <coughs> uh, me here and myself uh, in, in some work in 2006 um, looked at this a little bit more carefully, this uh, idea that, okay, now we have this new goal of building transforms that are pseudorandom oracle preserving, and maybe this is, this is great, we should just uh, get rid of Merkle Damgar with strengthening and, and use this for building new hash functions. And, it, and indeed we agree that, uh, that it's a very desirable property because, as we've seen, it, it gives us some more confidence in using hash functions built with such transforms for uh, instantiating random oracles. But on the other hand, we point out there's actually some danger in using these types of transforms uh, to build the next generation of hash functions. And the important observation is that uh, hash functions are going to be used not only to instantiate random oracles, but just also for being collision-resistant functions. And in fact, uh, perhaps the bulk of such usage will be for the latter. And so the important question to ask is, will these pseudorandom oracle-preserving transforms actually yield collision-resistant functions? Now it's going to seem that this is, is the case because uh, if we build a uh, hash function with our pseudorandom oracle preserving transform, then it's going to behave much like a random oracle. And any random oracle uh, is going to be trivially collision resistant uh, because we would expect the outputs to collide with uh, low probability. But the caveat here is that this is only true in a setting where the compression function has been modeled uh, as itself being completely ideal. And so this turns out to be a problem. If we think about a real compression function, f, then by these impossibility results that I mentioned briefly before, we know that this is, is not really completely ideal, no matter how much we wish it would be. So this uh, above uh, chain of reasoning does not imply that, uh, yes? So, uh, these impossibility results, mm -hmm. don't they rely on the programmability property of the random oracle, which uh, you don't have to worry about here? Uh, that could be true. So if you're trying to instantiate a non-programmable random oracle, then, then maybe, maybe these impossible results wouldn't hold. But that we're trying to do the full thing uh, as far as programmability, having extractability, all these uh, properties. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so nevertheless, this uh, chain of reasoning is not going to give us uh, a justification that uh, the uh, hash function is uh, collision resistant. And this would be true actually for non-programmable random oracles too. Um, so, uh, the, and the, the problem here is, is, is real in, in the sense that the, the four transforms that I showed you uh, very briefly before uh, that have been proposed as replacements for merkle damgar with strengthening um, have the following uh, issue, is that there exist compression functions that are collision resistant, but uh, for which the hash function built using this uh, compression function and the pseudorandom oracle preserving transform is not collision resistant. So more generally we can think that uh, this means in other words that just a transform being pseudorandom oracle preserving doesn't imply that it's also going to be collision resistance preserving. And so let's look at this for uh, the chop transform again, our simple example. We want to build a particular, we're going to try and build a compression function f that uh, is not, uh, I'm sorry, which is collision resistant, but uh, for which when we use it inside our transform, it's the resulting hash function is not going to be collision resistant. And um, so we can do that uh, as follows. Specify a, a compression function f that takes input a chaining variable c and a message block x. And we'll define it in this uh, a seemingly strange way that if both inputs are all zero bits, then the output is all zero bits. And otherwise, we'll apply some other function that uh, 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 outputs n minus 1 bits and concatenates a 1 to it. And then that's the result of, of f. 
And so we can make two claims about this. The first is that uh, this, F, this compression function f is collision resistant. Uh, uh, as long as the underlying function that we're using h is collision resistant also. And that's uh, somewhat easy to see because uh, the message of all zero bits is not going to be able to collide with any other message because of this one that we're concatenating here. Uh, okay, so that gives us a collision resistant function, uh, compression function, although maybe a little strange looking. And the second claim is that uh, if we use this inside the chop transform, then we end up with uh, a hash function that's trivially, it's trivial to find collisions against. And that's easy to see by just looking at uh, a string of one, uh, two messages, one being just one block of zeros, another being two blocks of zeros. And if we follow the logic, we'll end up with uh, outputs both being uh, strings of zero bits. So similar counterexamples uh, exist for the other three transforms. And what do these counterexamples really mean? Well, it means that um, in terms of collision resistance, the guarantee of transforms that are only pseudorandomorical preserving is actually going to be worse than the previous transform, merkle damgar with strengthening, um, in the sense that they don't guarantee for all compression functions that you're going to be able to construct a, a collision-resistant, or for all collision-resistant compression functions, you're going to be able to uh, generate a hash function that's collision-resistant. And so the root of this problem, as we saw before, is that the, the pseudorandom oracle preservation goal only provides a guarantee of security in a, uh, a very, very strong model uh, for the compression function f. And so this, this speaks against uh, using hash functions built with these transforms uh, for future standards. So in review, we've seen that this pseudorandom oracle preservation goal is, is nice because it uh, helps us build hash functions with, uh, with which we can use uh, them as random oracles with high confidence. But at the same time, they don't guarantee that uh, we can build uh, a collision-resistant function uh, when we have a compression function that's collision-resistant. So, okay, the obvious question is, well, what type of transform should we be using? Well, the natural solution is just to require the transform be simultaneously collision resistance preserving and pseudorandom oracle preserving. And this is going to fix the, the previous problems that we had with only pseudorandom oracle preserving transforms. Let's look at this uh, with our two application scenarios that we've looked at so far. So we have a transform that is simultaneously uh, preserves both properties. Then when we want to use it to instantiate a random oracle, uh, we'll get a guarantee of security uh, as long as uh, under the admittedly strong assumption that f is a random oracle. Uh, strong but uh, necessary assumption. Whereas if we use our hash function for uh, settings where we just require collision resistance, we get a guarantee of security for our uh, a signature scheme under the much weaker assumption the compression function f is, is collision resistant. If we just use a, a pseudorandom oracle preserving transform, nothing changes in the left column, but uh, in the right, we would only have a guarantee of security if, if we make this very, very strong assumption about um, the compression function, which is in the end going to degrade our, our security guarantees. So there's, there's actually a very simple way to, to fix these transforms to make them uh, both collision resistant preserving and pseudorandom oracle preserving, which is just to add strengthening, which recalls uh, the appending of the message length before processing. Um, but while we're, uh, while we're investigating these uh, transforms, we note that hash functions actually have more applications than just the two we've described. In fact, they're used all over the place. So we have these two applications. We also use hash functions quite uh, widely for message authentication, key derivation, and there's uh, a quite wide variety of others. And so we should be trying to build transforms that are going to help us give security guarantees for as many of these applications as possible. So let's look at... Uh, the two most, in, uh, most important just based on how widespread the use is. So, to, uh, so a message authentication system is, allows two parties who share some common secret key uh, to do the following thing. One of them can generate a message and then a tag value and send it to the other party. And the other party can then uh, verify this tag uh, for the message and have confidence that uh, whoever sent this message and tag pair uh, would have needed the secret key to uh, generate it. And so it turns out, uh, and this is very useful for all kinds of things, you can think of it almost as a symmetric uh, equivalent of digital analog of digital signatures. Um, and hash functions actually turn out to be a very cheap and, and efficient way of building message authentication codes. And what we do is we just add key bits to our hash function and uh, say by setting aside some message uh, of the message input for the secret key. 
And then we can just generate our tag by hashing using this keyed version of the hash function uh, uh, across the message. So in order to, for this to be secure, well, we would ask that the hash function when keyed uh, is going to act as what we call a good message authentication code or a good MAC. And this intuitively just means that most of the output bits of the hash function uh, when applied to a message are going to be unpredictable to anyone who doesn't have the key. This other application, key derivation, uh, we have a, a party who has some secret key and wants to generate more secret keys. And so each of these derivative uh, secret keys are going to be used for maybe uh, several different uh, cryptographic primitives. Maybe they'll use K1 for an encryption scheme. They'll use K2 for a message authentication code, uh, etc. And so to ensure security in these uh, uh, target schemes, we would want that the derivative keys are indistinguishable from random bits. Um, and so again, there's an easy solution using hash functions. Uh, we key the hash function again, and then we can just generate these derivative keys using our, our keyed hash function. Uh, here we're going to need a slightly stronger property that uh, the hash function when keyed acts like a good pseudorandom function, which just means that all of these bits are going to indeed, uh, all the output bits uh, when applied to a message are going to uh, be unpredictable to an adversary that doesn't know the original key. So to summarize, we have these two new properties that we would like uh, from our hash functions. One, that uh, they behave as good message authentication codes, which just means most bits are unpredictable. And simultaneously, that they uh, should uh, be useful as pseudorandom functions where all the bits are unpredictable. Uh, and so it, intuitively, it's, it's somewhat easy to see that the notion of being a good pseudorandom function implies the notion of being a good message authentication code because we're just asking that more of the bits are unpredictable, but that the converse is not going to be true. So minimally, we would ask that uh, uh, our hash functions, uh, our transforms help us build hash functions that are good pseudorandom functions when keyed. So we can again ask this question about, well, will pseudorandom oracle preserving transforms, which uh, seem strong in some sense, uh, suffice for building good pseudorandom functions, and kind of repeat our earlier uh, logic when we were thinking about collision resistance, and might be tempted to think that uh, this would be the case, because if something's a, a random oracle, then uh, we can key it in almost any imaginable way, and it's going to be a good pseudorandom function. But again, this is going to be a problem, because uh, this uh, type of logic is only going to hold in a setting where the compression function is completely ideal. And so even for a compression function that is itself a good pseudorandom function when keyed appropriately, uh, you're not going to get a guarantee that the uh, constructed hash function is also a good pseudorandom function. So the obvious solution uh, after this, uh, all these slides is that uh, we should be using multi-property preserving transforms, which are going to simultaneously preserve all the properties that uh, we're interested in having in our uh, built hash function. So to, uh, to sub uh, substantiate use of hash functions for all the settings that we've looked at so far, we would at least ask that the transform H be collision resistance preserving, pseudorandom oracle preserving, and pseudorandom function preserving. And so this is going to be nice. Uh, if we think about the current situation where we have, um, before using multi-property preserving transforms, if we have a single transform uh, for each property that we're interested in, and, uh, and therefore uh, for each application, and therefore they're only good for building um, hash functions that are going to be good for one type of application. So if we follow this approach, then the, the result would seem to be that we'd have to build multiple different hash functions. Uh, even if we just started with the same compression function. And this is going to have a, a bunch of, of quite obvious downsides. You'd have to standardize numerous hash functions and, and complicate people's lives. If we replace all those with just a single transform, then, uh, then we can use it to build a hash function for, starting from a single strong compression function. And uh, this obviates the uh, prior problems. So we, we uh, go ahead and uh, uh, suggest a multi-property preserving transform. And what it does is uh, it iterates a compression function f over some message blocks. And the output of that is concatenated with some more message bits and the length of the message. And then this is run through a special, through the compression function again, but in a, a different way than what was done before. And we call this last uh, application, the compression function, uh, an envelope, hence the, the name envelope, Merkle Damgard. And for those of you who know, it's similar in design to NMAC and, and also a chain shift construction that was uh, uh, built in different setting, which I'm going to be talking about in a second. Um, and it combines several techniques uh, to preserve each of these uh, properties independently. So 
so the strengthening, this uh, appending the length, ensures that the transform is going to be collision resistance preserving. The envelope, uh, together with the fact that we're going to require that the initialization vectors used here, which are just constant strings again, bit strings, are, are distinct, gives us that uh, the transform is pseudorandom oracle preserving. And finally, if we replace these initialization vectors with keys, uh, then the result is a uh, pseudorandom function under the assumption that the compression function f is a good pseudorandom function. And uh, therefore, the uh, transform is pseudorandom function preserving. So <coughs> this is the pretty much the first part of the, the talk, is, is discussing this multi-property preser preservation goal. And so it seems like a very nice uh, way to a new approach for building hash functions that's going to address security uh, in all the applications that hash functions find themselves in nowadays. So uh, an interesting uh, a question, of course, then is, well, is this the only uh, setting for designing hash functions? And it turns out it's not. So now in the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about a different uh, setting for doing hash function design. So I guess maybe I, I could pause here. If there are people who have questions, we could uh, take them. Okay, good. Great yeah. So if you have uh, something that satisfies this um, pseudorandom oracle mm -hmm. preserving uh, property, then that would eliminate, for example, the extension attack? Exactly, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to ensure uh, intuitively that the, the structure is sound and you can't do these types of things. So, um, and because a random oracle is, is by its very definition a completely unstructured object, it's completely black box. You un don't know anything about how, what's going on inside of it. It's just outputting random bits. And that's what we would like to approach with our, our real hash functions. And so being pseudorandom oracle preserving at least uh, ensures this under the strong assumption of the compression function. OK. So, uh, so we're going to look at another setting now. Um, recall that uh, in the everything up to this point, we've been talking about starting with a compression function which just has a d-bit message block and an n-bit chaining variable. And then one builds a hash function out of this using some domain extension transform. Hopefully, I've convinced you that we should be using multi-property preserving transform. Uh, there exists another setting called what we call the dedicated key setting, where we use a richer primitive to begin with. Uh, and it, we'll call this uh, primitive a dedicated key compression function. And all we've done is simply add a, a k-bit key input uh, to the compression function. And then again, we're going to use this uh, primitive to build a hash function, which we'll call a dedicated key hash function, uh, which also has a key input. Uh, maybe it takes more bits, uh, more key input than uh, just one compression function key. Still, we're going to be using domain extension transforms to, uh, to, to specify how to do this uh, hashing of long strings. So for, uh, as a simple example of a transform here, we can just think of the strength in merkle damgur transform in this setting, in the dedicated key setting, is now just going to iterate this a keyed version of, of, of this keyed uh, compression function, and uh, but before still do all the other stuff uh, such as uh, uh, appending the length. So just to try and clear up uh, the difference in these two settings, in the traditional, what I'm going to call the traditional setting, uh, we start with this primitive that has no key and build an unkeyed uh, hash function. Uh, and in the dedicated key setting, we, we have keys for both uh, objects. So we're going to want to use our hash functions uh, in, in settings where people need to publicly compute the hash function. So for example, with signatures and random oracles, we want everyone to be able to compute the hash function. In the traditional setting, this was easy. We had just a fixed uh, hash function, and everyone knew, knew it, so they can uh, compute it. In this new setting, we have a key input. Um, and so to compute it, you would need, so to use it in public uh, usage scenarios, you would uh, need to, someone would need to pick a key and then publish it. And so we'll just make the key public. So although I'm using the term key, I don't really want to imply that it's a, a secret key. It can also be public. Uh, there are secret uh, uh, situations where we want to use our hash function with secret keys. And we saw the message authentication and, pseudo, uh, and the key derivation examples before. And so in this traditional setting, we had to go through this extra step of keying uh, the keyless hash function. And, uh, and then we can then use it with these secret keys. In the new setting, of course, we have a uh, key input already. And so we can use that for the secret key material. So <coughs> what's, um, what's uh, known, what's, what are these two settings really been used for? Well, we've seen that uh, the traditional setting 
uh, was where we've d uh, developed all of the widely used hash functions that uh, all the hash functions that are widely used today. Um, whereas in the dedicated key setting, cryptographers have uh, have done quite a bit of analysis of hash functions, uh, including building several lots of transforms that are in this setting, and yet uh, no full hash functions, at least as far as I'm aware of, have actually been that are in the that were built in the dedicated key setting and have key inputs are are widely deployed. And it would seem that this discrepancy uh, really stems from the fact that. Uh, there's, there seems to be this belief that the advantages of using this stronger, this richer primitive in the dedicated key setting, uh, the advantages of this are really only theoretical in nature. Uh, and in that they make uh, some analysis easier and some definitions easier for cryptographers to handle. But in terms of actually, in actual cryptographic practice, uh, it seems like these benefits maybe aren't so important and so we might as well just stick with the uh, uh, unkeyed uh, uh, traditional setting. So uh, Mihir and I uh, re -look looked at this uh, discrepancy a, a bit again. And in particular, we uh, discovered that there's actually some practical advantages uh, of using hash functions that are built in this dedicated key setting. And so I'm going to uh, briefly talk about some, a couple of examples of why it might be very interesting to actually be building and deploying hash functions built in the dedicated key setting. And of course, there are some disadvantages also, uh, namely one big disadvantage, which I'll discuss. And uh, so the, having uh, looked at these advantages and disadvantages, maybe someone would be interested in, in, in building uh, hash functions in the dedicated key setting. And so we go ahead and, and analyze transforms in this setting, which is what we like to do. Uh, and we'll do so from a, a multi-property preserving perspective, which hasn't been done before. So I'll talk about these, uh, these two uh, big items. So what, what are the benefits uh, with, with perhaps significant practical impact of using dedicated key hash functions? So I'll talk about two. One is this notion that we call hash function heterogeneity. And the other is uh, improved security guarantees, uh, particularly for message authentication, which is an important application hash function as I discussed before. So hash function heterogeneity is actually a pretty simple idea. It's just since we have a dedicated, if we have uh, hash functions which have key inputs, well, users can actually then choose their own hash keys. And breaking, uh, now an adversary trying to break uh, the hash function, will have to break individual instances of the hash function. To make this concrete, let's just look at one of the uh, applications of, of hash functions, which is building digital signature schemes we saw before. So in the traditional setting, we just hash a message and then sign it. In the dedicated key setting, we can uh, do a similar thing, but now we're using a keyed uh, hash function to do the, the first step. And so if we think about a multi-user scenario where uh, everyone's, uh, m many parties are using uh, digital signature schemes. We have Bob and Sue here, for example, but there could be many more. Uh, in the traditional setting, well, each of these parties would choose their own public key, secret key, which would be for the signing portion of the hash and sign um, construction. And then they would publish their public keys somewhere to a, a trusted bulletin board, which we'll call a certificate authority, so that everyone can see them. Now an adversary uh, here is going to, if he wants to break the digital signature um, scheme for these uh, parties, well he can try and do so by uh, finding collisions against the hash function, as we, we discussed uh, before. And so even if this takes uh, quite a bit of work, say something like 2 to the 61 uh, operations, once he's done, so, done this uh, large amount of work, He's succeeded in compromising uh, uh, the security of all users' uh, digital signature schemes. And the only fix is, is what we're actually facing now as a community, which is to, de to design and deploy a new hash function. So even if he does have to do a lot of work, he's done. Once he's done it once, everybody's, everybody's toasted. Um, now if we replace, if we think about uh, the same uh, setting, but with dedicated keys, hash functions, now each user is going to additionally pick uh, a, a hash function key. So we have K sub Bob there uh, and K sub Sue over on the right. And uh, publishes as part of their public key. And so now uh, the adversary who would want to come and uh, break uh, people's digital signature schemes, well, he's going to have to attack the individual instances. So to 
break uh, Bob's hash uh, to break Bob's uh, instance of the digital signature scheme, uh, he would uh, via the hash function he would uh, try and find collisions against that particular key, which maybe again is going to take uh, two to sixty one work. But then to go on to break Sue's uh, uh, instance, uh, he would have to attack uh, a different hash function key, doing perhaps again two to the sixty one work. And so doing some simple arithmetic, we get uh, that he has to do more work. And of course, if he has to do this for lots of different parties, then um, this uh, could turn to much more work for the adversary. And, and additionally, there's actually a, a temporary fix for, um, for these attacks, which is the Bob or Sue could just pick new keys, forcing uh, the adversary to repeat this effort. Which is, I say temporary, because of course, if the adversary's attacks get better, then eventually you'd have to deploy a new hash function. But maybe this would suffice for a little while. So this uh, notion of hash function heterogeneity, uh, it seems like in, in practice, uh, it could be a practical hurdle for attackers. Um, because for these types of collision finding attacks particularly, which are on the cusp of practicality, um, the, this extra type of security buffer could be quite beneficial. And of course it has this nice property of easily refreshing uh, keys. So let's look at uh, an, another uh, benefit of the uh, dedicated key setting. If we think about message authentication, well, we use a if we use a transform like uh, envelope Merkle Damgard, which I talked about before, to build a hash function that we want to use for message authentication, then we're going to get a guarantee of security uh, only under the uh, assumption that the, the compression function f is a pseudorandom function, which means, again, that all of its output bits are going to be unpredictable. And this is because uh, envelope Merkle Damgard is pseudorandom function preserving. Uh, so using such a compression function helps you, and this transform helps you build a, a good pseudorandom function. And then any good pseudorandom function is a good message authentication code also. Now, we point out this security guarantee is actually worse than what one would get if they started with just a, a compression function that was assumed to be a message authentication code and a transform that was message authentication code preserving. And why is this the case? Well, since a pseudorandom, being a pseudorandom function is strictly uh, harder than being a good message authentication code, um, we would imagine that uh, breaking a compression function in terms of being a pseudorandom function is actually going to be easier than breaking it as message authentication code. And intuitively, th this is uh, just because uh, predicting some of the bits of the output, maybe just a few of them, is sufficient to, uh, uh, to break it as a pseudorandom function, but certainly not as a message authentication code. And so if such an attack as this does exist, then uh, we're, we're, we lose our security guarantees uh, under uh, transforms like EMD. Um, but we're still, we're still OK if we had a message authentication code preserving transform. So you're probably wondering why I'm beating up on my own construction a little bit here. Um, why didn't we consider message authentication code preserving in the first place when we uh, did the first 30 minutes of this talk? Well, the problem is that in the traditional setting, actually, it's, it's, there's no known efficient merkle damgard style transforms that preserve me being a message authentication code. Um, and, and it doesn't seem, uh, I don't want to make bold claims, but it doesn't seem likely that we'll have uh, ones that do that anytime soon. So uh, whereas in the dedicated key setting, there are actually a very, some, several very efficient transforms that preserve uh, being a message authentication code. And so for message authentication, which uh, again is a very important application of hash functions, this uh, means we're going to get stronger security guarantees for our uh, uh, applications. So there's, I just talked about a couple benefits, and there's, there's, quite, there's some theoretical benefits I didn't really want to get into. Um, and we're not we weren't claiming to be exhaustive in uh, in it by any means. We think that actually if you had this extra input, this key input, people would be able to come up with clever uses for it um, or see other benefits that we, we haven't seen. So what about the downsides of this uh, approach? Well, the obvious one and, and probably most crucial is the efficiency loss. Uh, in the traditional setting, one would just have to process n plus d bits per block. Um, but now if you're using a dedicated key primitive, which is a, a richer primitive, you're going to have to do n plus d plus k bits uh, of processing per block, which may make it harder to build uh, efficient compression functions uh, in this setting. Uh, just a brief note that uh, if we want to have backwards compatibility with unkeyed uh, hash functions for, um, for uh, existing schemes, well, this is actually easy to do because we can just have someone pick a, a key and then fix it uh, for everybody. Okay, so. We've seen um, 
maybe maybe uh, dedicated key transform uh, dedicated key hash functions are a good way to go. So what type of transforms should we be using in this setting? Um, again, we're going to try and target multi-property preserving transforms. So we have this initial list of three from the first part of the talk. And we can add MAC preservation. And we can also add uh, this other goal, which is target collision resistance preservation. I, haven't had, I don't have time to go into the details, but for those of you who know, I just wanted to put it up there. And so we surveyed uh, a bunch of uh, transforms in this setting and determine whether uh, each transform preserved all of the properties. Uh, uh, we uh, set out to determine which transforms preserved which properties. And the blue, the blue are known results, I guess, and the, the orange are, are new results that we added. So we basically filled out this table. Um, and on the right, it just shows how many key bits are required for each uh, transform. And so what we'll notice is that uh, none of the transforms preserve all five properties. Um, and only one of them preserves uh, the first four properties. Now, preserving target collision resistance, I didn't have time to talk about this very much, but it actually requires a significant number of key bits, and there's some uh, imp uh, impossibility results that, that suggest that we're not going to do much better. So target collision resistance maybe is in a category of its own. But uh, nevertheless, uh, even the one, the, the one transform that preserved the first four properties requires two compression function keys, which is this... Uh, fourth one down, strengthened nested nested iteration transform. So we, we thought we can do better than that. And so we just uh, introduced two new transforms that are, um, that use a lot of the techniques from above, but combine them to uh, generate multi-property preserving transforms. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I should put that on the slide. Sigma is the, the maximum number of message blocks that you can hash. And so actually the, there's an impossible result that shows that the target collision resistance, you really need a transform that's going to use a logarithmic number of key bits in the number of messages, message blocks hashed. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, and so, so, which means it may not be the most practical goal for, for every setting. So, which is why we, we stuck with two down here. One that uh, preserves the first four, but uses the minimal number of key bits. And uh, another uh, transform that preserves all five, but uses the, uh, well, minimal number of key bits to get uh, to target collision resistance preservation. So in the end, we have these three, these three suggested multi-property preserving transforms. Um, in the end, they actually all share quite a bit of uh, structural similarity, uh, even though they're being used in different settings. So we have the original image of the uh, diagram of the of, uh, envelope merkle damgard And then if we just add, uh, if we just start with uh, uh, a dedicated key compression function, then we actually end up with the strength and chain shift. And so the, the structure is basically the same. Um, now for the envelope shoot, we need these extra key bits, and those end up getting masked in. You can come talk to me about it later uh, if you're curious more about it. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that th there's a lot of structural similarity uh, in terms of how to preserve uh, all these various properties. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up. So <coughs> this talk was really about uh, exploring new approaches to building cryptographic hash functions that... Uh, are going to give us broad security guarantees. And this is in response to the fact that hash functions are used for a wide range of applications now, uh, 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 wider than what they're origi perhaps originally intended for. And minimally, we, we really need uh, uh, hash functions to be collision resistant, to be good pseudorandom functions, and to, quote unquote, have this property of behaving like a random oracle. And we saw in the first part of the talk that uh, we need to be able to establish uh, it, it's best to establish these first two uh, security properties under minimal uh, standard assumptions, such as being collision resistant, the compression function being collision resistant, or the uh, compression function being a pseudorandom function. And then uh, for this uh, uh, behaving like a random oracle property, we want to uh, establish under this minimal ideal uh, assumption of the compression function uh, being um, itself a fixed input length random oracle. So this broad approach, you know, gives us good security guarantees for many applications and. We think that uh, this is the right approach for building uh, hash functions to uh, uh, satisfy NIST's um, goals and, and the goals of the community in general. So as far as the two parts of the talk in particular, we just we talked about these multi-property preserving transforms, which help us achieve this goal in the traditional, uh, we talked about first in the traditional setting, and uh, introduced a new transform. And then uh, we went on to talk about a different setting, which has, has been, in some sense, overlooked, uh, perhaps by the cryptographic community, where we start with a dedicated key compression function, which is a richer primitive, 
and just highlighted a couple of the practical benefits and, and, and the major downside of this. And we did uh, a survey of, of these transforms. So I didn't go into a lot of details, none of the, none of the fun formalisms uh, that uh, are in the papers. So, uh, so there's some references, and you can get them all, the full versions off my web page. Uh, and, and here's a nice picture to remind me of San Diego since I'm up in Seattle for the summer. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks so for the talk. Great. Any questions? So I'm wondering, did you look did, did you look at the security of concrete instantiations of envelope Merkle Dumber? Concrete instantiations, but you mean with a particular with compression a particular, function? With a particular uh, compression function. Well, the problem is we don't have any. I mean, the the uh, compression functions that have been used before, like the ones under SHA and MD, we don't like anymore. And so the cryptanalytic community is coming up with new ones. And so we haven't looked at uh, any in particular yet. Um, um, yeah. So I don't know what we would do with the concrete instantiation, try and cryptanalyze it. Uh, it's a little bit outside my, uh, my uh, specialty. So yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to depend on what type of compression function you want to build. Uh, there aren't any good examples of, of, of in my mind, of, of dedicated key compression functions yet. So our point was more that uh, this is something that maybe cryptanalysts should, um, say cryptanalysts, but cryptanalysts are the ones who generally make the compression functions. That it's something they should consider, that maybe adding uh, key inputs and, and setting them aside would be good. I would imagine that uh, if, you, if you were going to do this, you would make the, the key input approximately the same size as the uh, chaining variable. But that's just a, a wild conjecture, um, not knowing a lot of the details of the internals of the compression function. So about 160 bits. So um, just to yeah. play devil's advocate Absolutely. a little bit here, or maybe just to clarify, really. Um, you know, in, in, at the beginning of your talk, you had, we had the scenario, if we have a collision-resistant compression function, and then we put it into a particular transform, we had a, a result, I forget who it was attributed to, that, you know, if, the, that the, if you broke it, that you would have had to break the compression function, right. which is indeed what they did. Yes. So what I'm kind of wondering is, I mean, this seems like a useful framework, say, for NIST, but mm. isn't it just like one half of the puzzle? Oh. Of the, I mean, so underlying all of this, in any of these other categories, like looking like a random oracle and things like that, you really just, with this work, kind of isolated the problem to producing a compression function which does all of those things. That's absolutely true, right? So to, to, uh, and, and to realize uh, this dream of having multi-property hash functions uh, via multi-property preserving transforms, we need multi-property compression functions. Um, but uh, it seems like this is what, uh, this is what uh, compression function designers are going to need to do anyway uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, to, to build new hash functions. They're going to have to go and build these things and, uh, so that they meet uh, the security requirements for all these applications. And so what we've done is said, okay, well, you're going to do this anyway, so we need transforms now that are going to help take whatever you guys come up with and build uh, hash functions that preserve all these nice properties that you built into the compression function. But you're right, we've only, we're only talking about uh, half the battle, so to speak, or maybe even a, less, a little bit less if you think uh, building compression functions is very difficult, um, which it's, it certainly seems to be. Um, Can you say anything about the strategy for building compression functions then? Yeah, so I mean, the, the strategy that, uh, that seems to have been used over the last 10 years is to make hash, uh, in my mind, is my opinion, is that they make them as complicated as possible in some sense. So you have something like, something like the Shaw compression function, which is really based on a block cipher. It's doing lots of mixing and munging and, and uh, uh, transformations on the bits uh, in order to obfuscate relationships between inputs and outputs. And this is what makes it hard for cryptanalysts to go in there and say, OK, now I want to try and make a collision. How do I go through this? But it also serves to make it uh, uh, good at being a, a black box and being like a random oracle. Um, now, at Wong and those uh, uh, people showed it basically that it wasn't confusing enough in some sense uh, that uh, they, can, they can actually find these differential paths to uh, understand enough of the internal structure to be able to construct collisions with high probability. Um, so that's my intuitive understanding of, of, of the way uh, 
of the status of compression functions in some sense. And if you were to use for your compression function something based on like a hard mathematical problem, like yeah. a hash. That's great. Yeah, so we, we've been doing, oh, I should let you finish your question. I no, got excited. <laughs> Right, right. So the problem, and, and I actually have a whole other set of slides somewhere set up to talk about this issue, is, is if, what if you want to do, if you do want to use mathematical constructs? Um, and the problem with mathematical constructs is if you're using them based on factoring or discrete logs, they have a lot of mathematical structure. And so while they are generally being made just to resist collision resistance attacks, and you can uh, uh, do them in such a way that uh, finding collisions against these mathematically structured objects will imply like factoring uh, that you can factor some large modulus. Uh, that's only going to be good for collision resistance. For being like a random oracle, which is supposed to be an unstructured object, these are really unsuitable candidates because of all the mathematical structure. Um, so if you do want to start with uh, this type of uh, 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 primitive and, and still build a hash function that's going to be useful in um, multiple ways for like instantiating a random oracle which needs to be a good black box and you're going to need to do something else. And we, I, we actually submitted a paper on this, uh, how, to, how to build a hash function out of a collision resistant function, um, which is a slightly different approach. So we can talk about it more later too if you're interested. Thanks.